Christian was, and we just went in there and started cracking people around. I'll tell you how I was introduced to this, apart from Dr. Syriac's course, but I remember Cliff Fowler when they introduced a course in Britain which was the pilot manipulation course. Okay, and Cliff got one of these places. There was only about eight places and um, he got one of them. So he goes on this course and we are waiting. I was in the military department. We are waiting in the department for him to come back at night to teach us what he'd learned that day. Now he had a particular ability to be able to sort of do cracking joints. But we wanted that skill as if it matters. I went bashing away there. And this was how we were. A guy that's just done it, just been introduced to two or three things, and he's teaching us how to do these things. You know? And even so, we're still walking around, we're not paraplegic or quadriplegic or anything. And so, even under those very bad circumstances, we still had probably sufficient within us to know when not to do things. But it is very important, and I want to sort of do this a little bit more formally in a moment or two. Now, what's happening in North America or in the United States at the moment is quite exciting. And I would sort of ask you to sort of think on this, and perhaps Anne could be a little bit more um, helpful than I can. But you've heard that there is now the North American Academy of Manipulative Therapy has been formed, which is now a provisional member of the IFOMT, only provisional in the sense that there are one or two other requirements that have to be brought up which are political things with the American Physical Therapy Association. But as far as the requirements for IFOMT, in terms of the academic requirements and all this, the United States are now a member of the International Federation. Now why is that so important is this, that the United States are the first country that have managed to get together an umbrella group which under this umbrella group, there can be all these different training schools. There can be the um, Institute in St. Augustine, there can be the Grimsby group, there's the group out in, um, um, in Folsom. You know, there's all of these various groups. There's the one in um, Rochester, which I sort of teach at for on occasion. And so all of these groups are going to have their own training system. And then there'll be the umbrella group. And of course, there's the group that you're part of, the Institute. Now, what I would like to say about this is that there's going to be a kind of a moratorium period where you'll be able to sort of present yourself for whatever the examination thing is for the academy. And there's not going to be, for the first time, little while, a residency requirement. But in about three years, there will be. But unfortunately, one of the requirements, the prerequisites for doing this would be that you would have the examination of the, whatever institute you're coming from, but also that you've got the OCS exam, because that's the thing of the American Physical Therapy Association. But I would suggest all of you to sort of think very seriously about getting that academy membership, even if it means you're taking the, well, it will mean you're taking the OCS before you have to start doing the residency requirements because that just makes it more complicated. But you know, if you ever want to develop what's going on in the United States, we've got to have some kind of group that is overall looking at manual therapists. And this over umbrella group is the thing. And I find that very exciting. There's an umbrella group now started in um, Germany and there's some political ramifications of that there and they're struggling with that at the moment and I'm hoping that IFOMT can actually force them to get together because we didn't think there would be any problem. When people go back and start talking about the various agendas of the different groups, you find that the agenda isn't for manual therapy excellence, it's some other ulterior thing that's built in there as well. And I think that it's so exciting in the United States that you've managed to do this. Now I would say, and I did say this in St. Augustine, that a lot of this has been under the auspices of Stanley Paris. I don't think you'd be anywhere today unless he'd done what he did a long time ago. You know that book by Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled? He was traveling that road when there were very other few people on it in the United States, and who was actually physical, or not physically, but really blocking any progress of physical therapists to become more and more excellent. Because that's what we're seeing in it. We're a special group. And the other group within physical therapy are worried that people are trying to get specialization, as if it makes any difference to them. 
You know, so this is, I think, where it should be here, and I think it's very important that you understand the political ramifications because you're the representatives of the North American Institute too. And that's why it's important that, that you show what you can do within this whole thing. So you're the soldiers of this. Yes, Ralph. The hierarchy or the administration of the Yeah, there's Joe Farrell. Dick Earhart. Dick Earhart. Stan Paris was, but I kind of think he's <laughs> having his difficulties with the group. Mike Rogers, yeah. Michael Moore. Sven Bronson. Sven yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it should be, I think, provided they can keep it together and not everybody sort of start off saying how good their group is and it's better, I think, you know, we've just got to accept that the IFOMP standard should be a reasonable standard for proficiency. I like not to think about it as being the minimum standard, but everybody exceeds the IFOMP standard. But it should be a reasonable standard to produce a good manual therapist. And then each country with their own little things, like, like Chris's group in Eindhoven with this neurophysiological kind of approach that, that they um, have got as well. That would be a little special thing. With us, we kind of look at this sort of integrated quadrant approach. You know, there's all kinds of little things, and not one isn't better than the other. It's just how it suits the people that follow that system. It seems to fit their psyche. So I think this is really sort of important that we understand politically, being as we're the leaders in this, that we get in there and manage to influence the direction. Because I reckon if we don't, I wonder what's going to happen to physical therapy in the next 25 years. I mean, it'll see me out, <laughs> like another three or four years, but I'm talking about you and your careers forever. And then looking at what the chiropractors have got to now, which is sort of gradually increasing enhancement, where did they get this from? They got it from the chiropractors in 1910 and 1915 and 1920 and 1925 that were willing to stand up and fight the orthodox medical establishment when they got no credibility with anybody and they put their money in and they developed this political sort of arm of chiropractic and that's why today they are where they are getting more and more recognition and so this is what we've got to do and we put it into our own excellence but so that we can really establish where we are we've got to look at as the group's excellence too and so this is why the academy in the United States is so important and why your input will be absolutely vital to it. So, what I'd like to just do with you for um, just for a second or two is to say how can we utilize our past experience, our past um, theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge in terms of this particular course, because it's a building thing. I mean, all of the stuff that you've done before is relevant to what we're doing now. Some of it will be more relevant than it perhaps is on a muscle stretching course or on a mobilization course, but all of it is relevant. And what I'd like to do is, I sort of introduced this last time we were doing it, I'd like to sort of make you do it again, which is to look at some of the communication skills and some of the recall skills that have been developed out there. And what we know is that our recall of information is pretty abysmal. We do a course, and if you don't go through active recall, at specific times during the day, by the end of two days, your retention rate is like 25% of the stuff that we've done. And that's pretty bad. When you think that in a week it's down to something like 15%. That means you spend all this time and within a week or two weeks, you're down to perhaps 20% retention. That's why it's important to have manuals, why it's important to have perhaps and we might be able to just do a, a couple of hours or something just doing techniques so that you don't have to listen to all the talk, which would be kind of nice. You could sort of, you know, put in number 15, rub it through on, on your VCR and there comes up a technique. That might be kind of a good thing to do with this, which would augment some of the um, manuals as well. Tony Buzan, who is a British communicator who's been on BBC and done a whole lot of uh, stuff in terms of retention levels, 
has been somebody that I followed because he did a, a book called Use Your Head, which seems kind of a good thing to be using for us. Um, and he developed this thing of mind mapping or concept mapping, which I'd sort of like you to use this week. What is it? We did it last time. Where we come up with a central theme like this. Let's say it's the cervical spine. And he kind of does all little sort of things like this, you know. So that we know that it's the cervical spine that we're talking about. That it's like in a, <coughs> in a computer. We open up the file cervical spine. And then we go into the subfiles. And what he says is we do not think sequentially. We think randomly. And if we're thinking sequentially, we stick ourselves along a particular pathway. So what we need to do, because we've got to try and bring out all of this information that you have from all of these previous courses, whether it be the muscle energy, which will be quite useful, whether it be some of the McKenzie stuff, which is quite useful, which is all of this for this course, very, very important stuff, then we need to sort of bring it together. So, when we're doing this, we've got this central theme of the cervical spine, and we perhaps think that the biomechanics of the cervical spine is important. And then we perhaps, from the, um, somewhere in our mind, we think of contraindications. And then from somewhere in our mind, we think of biomechanics, I'm sort of thinking a little bit about the... Um, <clears throat> coupled movements that go on in the cervical spine. And immediately I think of coupled movements. I know that the coupled movements of the craniovertebral and the coupled movements of the cervical spine proper are different. And so I'm letting my brain just go randomly. And so this particular kind of usage of mind mapping will be very useful to you. And I'm going to get you to do that in a moment or two. But to break up any tendency that you have to even think sequentially with the lines on the paper here, we are going to turn these around this way and do it crossways. Because we have to break this up. Now, what can we use? We can use like a group brain thing with perhaps three of you. There will be times in the day when I say to you, this is you. This is a personal revision period of five minutes. And what I'll ask you to do is to perhaps do a mind map for yourself on what you consider to be the most important things that we've done in the last hour or something like that. But other times we can work in groups of three or four. Now, not today and this morning could it be too much of a hassle. And anyway, I want to make sure that I've got all your names, so I need you sitting in the right um, spots, all right? But after this, I'd like you to work with different groups. I mean, there won't be any bozos in this class, will there? Because you are certified manual therapists. There can't be. But occasionally you get people, you think, oh, God, well, I've got a real deadbeat here. <laughs> I'm having to do all the work. So if we sort of split up, then we'll get the advantage of our different sort of skill and thought process levels. So that's something that I would like you to do. Now, what's the difficulties of manipulating, let us say, where we're doing... <coughs> A small impulse at the end of the range. Now, I use that quite carefully, a small impulse at the end of the range. That sounds, doesn't it, a lot less threatening to our thought processes than to talk about a high-velocity thrust of small amplitude. That sounds pretty drastic. So we're talking about an impulse done at a barrier. Now, what's the problem with this for us, as we've all trained? The problem, as I see it, is this, that with all of our training up till now, we go for the barrier, or from our Syriax training, the term for the barrier is the end feel. And then what we do with the end feel is to move against the end feel, and we get the feedback from the end feel so that we can modify what we're doing. And if we feel more spasm is occurring, we ease off. If we feel that when we're doing that end feel, it's an end feel which now becomes inappropriate as far as this technique is concerned, we'll modify that technique. But all the time, we're getting a feedback. Now, with manipulation, we don't have that. We go up to the end feel, 
And then, with our impulse, we're going through that end field. That is the barrier to the movement. And what we have to do is to go through that barrier. And for a brief moment in time, we don't get any feedback. Now, that worries us. Because the whole of our training has been modifying what we're doing in terms of this feedback. So we need to be able to decide upon the correct cases to do this with, in terms of the joint, the correct profile of patient that has that joint problem, in terms of concurrent medical conditions. And then we need to be able to develop the correct technique. Now, manipulation isn't a benign thing. I mean, there have been fatalities with manipulation. But I think it's very important, and I'm going to sort of talk about this in a moment, because half the time we don't know the details of what happened. The details of manipulation accidents are usually so sparse. It's like a manipulation was performed. It's like somebody goes for an abdominal surgery and they die, and the thing is, an operation was performed. I mean, nobody knows about what the detail was. You know, did they chop in here and start throwing stuff around, or was it done through a, you know, what was the detail of it? We don't know that very often with manipulation. We don't know what examination was done prior to it. We don't know what questions were asked about medical conditions. They just give you this little paragraph, and somebody now has got Wallenberg's syndrome or something like this. And these are things that we need to know, because we have got to be the very best that can be in this regard. So, that Enfield problem is going to be a little bit of a problem for us. But we're talking about relatively gentle procedures. Chris, can I just borrow you for a second? And just sort of lay on the thing. I'll just go with the thoracic um, thing for a second. Just put your jacket on there. That's why it's all coming all the way down. It's okay? Yep. Uh, yes, please. Just put your head at that end. Okay, let's just, for a moment or two, just think a little bit about, say, a mobilizing procedure, which we could, um, let's do the cervical spine so that you can see it. I don't want to manipulate um, Chris's cervical spine at the moment, because I think we all need to look at each other and find out if there are, are any problems, and of course that's going to be part of this course. But if I were to do a technique of coming into a uh, movement, let's say, to come down to about um, C4-5, and find some stiffness. I could come around here and I could lift that 4-5 joint into a rotation to the left hand side and mobilize it. And I'm at the end range of that movement. Now I know that this is within Chris's um, barrier and I know that it's also within his control because if he was getting any sort of dizziness or anything like that he could tell me and I could desist from the procedure. But we are at the barrier, and we are repeating this movement at the barrier over a period of time. So, mobilization necessarily isn't always such a benign procedure either. Particularly when we get into the craniovertebral area, and particularly when we start looking at C1-2. Because movement, say, into left rotation is pulling this right facet forwards, and this might in fact be a problem, which we will talk about tomorrow when we are talking about the craniovertebral area. But when we talk about manipulation, as you did um, when you were, uh, those of you that um, did Diane's course, and in Diane you're seeing one of the best manipulators that um, I know, and this is one good thing, I think, about teaching, uh, you know, and being associated with a female manual therapist. Because very often, we come along, and we kind of got a bit more strength, a bit more height, and, oh, this is the way to do it. Olaf does this all the time. You know, and it's nice to, for a woman to say, look, that's impossible for a woman to do. 
We've got to do it this way. So this is what it's going to be a real advantage. But with Chris here, when we're talking about this repetitive motion, I mean, we're not talking about anything particularly violent. We're talking about just coming in and just doing that. That's the manipulation. And so when we look at mobilization, which is repetitive movement at the end range, sometimes the manipulation is even milder than the mobilization. And when you start thinking about muscle stretching, for example, let us take the sternocleidomastoid on the left-hand side, okay? So here we have to think to ourselves, right, sternocleidomastoid does this and it does that and it does this and it does this at this joint. So this means that we've got to get it into side bend right, into rotation left, okay? Then I've got to get it up into flexion. Then I'm going to come in here and hold it up in this position. Then I'm going to get down onto here and push down here and we all oh, come on board. You know, this is stuff done at the end range and this might be worse than when we're doing manipulation. So although we're going through the barrier, it's a very just brief little impulse and it shouldn't be done with violence and a lot of velocity. It's right at the end and a little impulse. Thanks, Chris. So this is what we are going to be doing over the next little six days of trying to do this to various joints. And I think that you will find this to be a, a sort of good experience. What we'll do every morning is we will take you in, into like three for perhaps um, 20 minutes or so and we'll kind of give you a little quiz on what we did the day before. So Anne and Chris will take a little group and I'll take a group and we'll just change round over the week. Not to threaten you, but just to sort of try and key in on the main points of the previous day. Now, how we're going to conduct this course, we have to modify it a bit. Of course, we can't be cracking joints all week. That would not be a very good thing to do. So we need to be able to, we've got examination procedures, we've got refinement of some of the mobilizing techniques that we've done previously, which we can, in fact, enhance a little, and we can do our manipulation. Now, as far as the manipulation is concerned, if we look at where the dangers are, of course they're in the cervical spine. And if we look in the cervical spine, of course they're at C1, C2. This is where 90% of all the problems that have ever come up have been found. Now the question is, would it be a good idea to sort of start at the sacroiliac where most of us couldn't produce any problems, even if we were totally ham-fisted, <laughs> if we went into the lumbar spine and gradually worked up our weight? This would seem to be a good idea. The problem is that by the time we get to the sixth day, we still haven't got to the worst area. And so I've stopped all that. We'll start with the cervical spine and we'll go on to the craniovertebral area in the first two days, which means that every day we can do procedures related to the cervical spine as our revision all week. Now, when we're doing certain areas, of course, it does put strain on other areas. And we don't want to sort of do that and build up soreness over a sort of a week period if we could avoid it. So instead of doing this sequentially, like going craniovertebral, cervical, cervicothoracic, upper thoracic, middle thoracic, you know, just working through the spine, I'm going to jump around a little bit, simply to give areas a break. So we're going to start with the cervical spine and we'll go into the craniovertebral. Then what we'll probably do is to go to the lumbar spine. Then we'll do the lumbar spine and we'll come back perhaps to the cervicothoracic junction and then we could go down to the sacroiliacs and then to the thoracic spine and the ribs. And so we can kind of move around a bit to give your bodies a break. But we will be getting opportunity every day to practice the techniques that we did the previous days. Now the other thing that you've got some experience in I mean, it's good that you've had experience in manipulation of the thoracic spine now, because that means we can move through that relatively quickly with perhaps a few more ideas as well, although I doubt that I've got any more ideas than Diane. But I don't hypothesize as much as she does now. <laughs> uh, she's still got all her marbles together. I think mine have gone. <laughs> um, so it means that we can do that relatively um, at the end of the week and know that we've at least got some expertise in that um, field. But the other thing that we've got expertise is in peripheral joint manipulation. This is something that you've already been doing. 
And so we can start to learn again the techniques for the spinal joints by thinking about the criteria and the way that you went about doing peripheral joints. And that's one of the things that we have done. We always put the peripheral joint manipulation in with our mobilizing techniques. Bill, you haven't done that, so um, that will be a little different, but you've had the previous experience anyway, so that's not going to be any great problem. But at the Institute in St. Augustine, the thrust course is done overall with the peripheral joints and the, manipu and the spinal joints done together. We've put the peripheral joints in because it follows the Norwegian system and it seemed to be a good way to get peripheral joint manipulation done early so that we could then build on it. There are upsides and downsides of all of this. So we can do some of that. Now it's going to be a little difficult this morning because we can't do that in terms of many joints in the body with the equipment that we've got here. But we'll be able to do one or two things. The other thing that I'd like you to do is this. <coughs> you've all heard, <coughs> excuse me, you've all heard <coughs> of the um, experiment where they did the basketball stuff. And the guys that practiced and practiced got better. And the ones that didn't practice didn't get any better, which would seem to be the case. But then the ones that just sat and thought about the shots and visualized, oh Alexa, thank you very much, and thought about the shots did really quite well. They improved their skills. And I'd like you to use this technique as well. I'd like you to think about the positions and let's say if I'd been doing the cervical spine here, jump up on here and I'm not going to do your cervical spine but let's just say that I was deciding to do the C23 and I'm going to uh, just lay on your back okay. and I was going to do a distractive technique which would mean that I would have to come into a position like this and just do a little impulse in that direction all right now I could well practice with a table without a patient there of coming in and just getting my body right and just doing a little movement making sure both arms move just getting that little impulse there with each of us here we don't always want to be doing it at the barrier but we can do it mentally just think about what to do we can also do it physically but without a patient there we can also do it by not taking it up to the barrier so we've got a little bit of a a resistance of tissue under our hands and just practice so that we know where our technique is and these are things I think you could, should be doing to enhance your skill so this is where we'll be sort of moving as far as techniques as well as actually doing the technique at the joint in question so there's a lot of ways that we can use this without putting ourselves under any threat and I think that there's very little threat anyway in terms of the gentleness of the technique particularly with Ann and Chris being here because you're going to have somebody right by your side all the time than if I had to get around the whole group myself and that's going to be really really a luxury thanks Ann all right Having sort of shown you that there's not going to be too much problem with this course, I don't want to get you complacent. So what I'd like you to do is to look at book two. No, book one. Book one. And have a look at the precautions and rules 